I was converted to faith in Jesus Christ 24 years ago when I was a tenured associate professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University. I was in a lesbian relationship with a woman who is also a professor. I had been in and out of serially monogamous lesbian relationships for a decade and a gay rights activist for two. My most popular classes at Syracuse were in feminist queer theory, which focused on the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin. I co-authored the university's domestic partnership policy, which served as a model for future gay marriage activism. I spoke at New York gay pride rallies, met famous gay rights activists, testified before New York policymakers, and advocated for LGBTQ rights. And I proudly became one of the tenured radicals who worked laboriously to make homosexuality look wholesome. And I did all of this because I believed that I was gay and that gay was good. In other words, dear Liberty students, I helped make some of the evil of the world in which we live. I didn't see myself as a lesbian until long after the time that all of my friends did. In my early 20s, I even dated men. And often as I was publicly dating men, I was privately falling in love with women. And my lesbian friends just told me that my coming out was only a matter of time. And so when I entered my first lesbian relationship at 28, I believed that I had found my authentic self. I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. As a professor and a writer, I used my platform to normalize homosexuality and promote all things LGBTQ. One article I authored featured as a back page editorial in a big New York newspaper was entitled, Promise Keeper's Message is a Danger to Democracy. It brought my Christian neighbors, Ken and Floyd Smith, into my life. At our first meeting, they told me that they accepted me as a lesbian, but they didn't approve. I started reading the Bible because I was curious about why Bible-believing Christians, that would be like people like y'all, wouldn't leave people like me alone. I mean, why did you have to evangelize? I started meeting with Ken and Floyd weekly and peppering them with questions about their biblical worldview. I read the Bible the way I was trained to read a book, reading large segments of the Bible, usually whole books, at one sitting, while fighting with its textual authority, authorship, canonicity, and hermeneutics. Slowly and over time, the Bible started to take on a life and a meaning that really startled me. But each time I warmed a little bit to the Bible, the doctrine of sin sent me scrambling. And what is the Christian doctrine of sin? Well, Christians believe that Adam's sin is imputed to everyone on earth, and thus we are all born in sin even before we commit our first act. Our sin separates us from a holy God, and we need Christ's ransom, deliverance, and power to live in God's righteousness. Because Jesus, the perfect God-man, lived in perfect obedience and died in the ignominy of the cross, he who is sinless became sin and thereby paid with his life for the sin of all of those who repent and believe in him. As born-again believers, Christians have Christ's resurrection power to crush even unchosen sin which the Bible records as treason against God and punishable by death in hell. A born-again Christian is justified by God, where God the Father imputes Christ's righteousness to the repentant sinner. And once justified, the believer learns to love what God loves and forsake all sin and battle against it. And that person then embarks on a life of progressive sanctification. The Bible records the battle for sanctification in epic terms, gritty, bloody, cosmic, and life and world changing. 
but the biblical doctrine of sin was a deal breaker for me. How could my lesbianism, something that feels right and doesn't hurt anyone, I claimed, how could it be sin? But there was also a clear biblical logical equivalence to faith that I had to confront. If God is the creator of all things, and if the Bible has his seal of truth and power, then the Bible has the right to interrogate my life and my culture and not the other way around. You know, even as a postmodern reader, I understood the idea that authority can only depend upon that which is higher than itself. I mean, I was a professor after all, and if your paper was due today and you give it to me next week, that was not gonna work so well for you. Uh, for no other reason other than I had authority over you. And I thought, who is higher than God? Well, my friends knew that I was reading the Bible and at a dinner gathering that my partner and I were hosting, my transgendered friend, a biological man who lived as a woman and went by the name Jill, cornered me in the kitchen. One night, he put a large hand over mine in the kitchen and said, Rosaria, this Bible reading is changing you. And I felt exposed. But what if it's true, I asked. What if Jesus is real and risen? What if we are all in trouble? And that's when I learned my transgendered friend's backstory. Rosaria, he said, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years with a wife and kids. I prayed that God would heal me, but he didn't. If you want, I will pray for you. Well, there. Now you know what some gay rights activists talk about in the kitchen. God's put eternity on the hearts of all men. I took offense, though, to my friend's offer of prayer. I didn't need healing. I didn't have cancer or bad knees or a cold. I believe that gay is good and valuable and ethical. The next day when I returned home from work, I found two large milk crates spilling over with theological books, my friend's seminary library. I opened the book on the top of the pile, and in my friend's handwriting, I learned something amazing, Jill's real name what we in the gay community call his dead name, Matthew. His name was Matthew. And a stark image snuck into my consciousness before I could do anything about it. Maybe Matthew, well, maybe Jill is a sham. I mean, this is Matthew. And, and somewhere out there, Matthew has a deserted wife and abandoned kids. That image started to burn a hole in my dearly held belief that living an LGBTQ plus life hurts no one. I turned to one of the books in the pile, Calvin's Institutes, and I flipped to a page where Matthew had written, watch Romans 1. So I opened my Bible and faced one of the passages that I had been dodging. Romans 1, starting with verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged the natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Indeed, Romans 1 doesn't end there as if that wasn't condemning enough for me, but it ends by highlighting homosexuality 
as something I'd never thought of it before. I thought it was a morally neutral form of sexual orientation. But this passage finds its crescendo in how one sin, homosexuality, morphs into others. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, malice, murder, strife, deceit. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew God and they knew God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give hearty approval to those who practice them. This last line grabbed me by the throat. It told me that people who cannot receive a blessing from God will demand one from men. My gay friends believe that we were all sexual minorities, a people group in need of political protection from a hostile world because of our never changing sexual orientation. But that's just not how the Bible understands homosexuality. According to the Bible, homosexuality may very, very, may very well reflect how you in your sin feel, but homosexuality will never represent who you are. I pondered that. I had heard from a pastor on campus that I was made in the image of God as a lesbian. And so I asked my Christian friends about this, and they pointed me back to Genesis 1, 27, 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. The created order, the pattern that God calls good, is clearly and unapologetically heterosexual. My Christian friends gently pointed out something else. Genesis 3.15 recorded that God has put enmity between his people and the world, the flesh, and the devil. Enmity is a strong word. It means inconsolable opposition. And transgenderism and homosexuality come from the world, the flesh, and the devil, not God's created order. My homosexuality was at enmity with God. That was the Bible's witness against me and against my life, like it or not, and I didn't. I started to think about what this meant for me and my friends long term. The Bible makes clear that we are male and female image bearers of a holy God whose soul and sex are ontological. They will go beyond this earth. But what about my friend Matthew? Well, from the Bible's point of view, if someone has mutilated his own body in the name of transgender delusion, but then repents of the sin of transgenderism, of the envy to be that which God has told you you cannot be, and puts his full trust in Jesus Christ, living in obedience to God's commands, his mutilated body will be resurrected in Christ to perfected glory when Christ returns, and he will live as the man he was intended to be for eternity in the new Jerusalem. You see, the Bible throws no one away, and neither should Christians. But the Bible sets the terms of God's blessing. God cannot be mocked. So what does the Bible record as the sin of homosexuality and transgenderism, if not physically acted upon? Well, that sin is the violation of the 10th commandment. You are not to covet your neighbor's wife or his sexual anatomy. And desiring someone or something that God prohibits, even before you act sexually or medically upon that desire, is the sin of covetousness. How devastating it was for me to realize that God had provided an entire commandment prohibiting the very thing I had given myself over to, coveting that which was not mine to possess. I had taught, studied, read, and lived a very different notion of what it meant to be a woman and a lesbian. And for the first time, 
I wondered if I was wrong. And after a year of wrestling with the Bible and meeting weekly with my Christian neighbors, two events unfolded that changed my life forever. The first was the moment the gospel revealed that I was Christ's enemy, that I was the enemy of my Christian neighbors, and that they loved me nonetheless. The second event was a growing reality that the Bible had gotten to be bigger inside me than I. Allow me to explain. Facing the fact that I was Christ's enemy was a powerful milestone. I was at Pastor Ken Smith's table, having shared another meal with my Christian neighbors, and I was nursing a grudge, coddling a feeling that these people, nice as they were, you know, they were my enemies. They didn't support gay rights. They didn't approve of my homosexuality. They accepted, but they didn't approve, and that stung. And after dinner, we sang Psalm 23, and we got, when we got to the line, a table thou has furnished me in presence of my foes, or as the ESV puts it, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, I broke out in a cold sweat and my brain came to a full stop. You see, I thought I was dining in the presence of my enemies. You know, these judgmental Christians who didn't approve of my homosexuality. And clarity came like a tractor beam. Just the opposite was true. I was the enemy. I was Christ's enemy, and I was my Christian neighbor's enemy, and they loved me in obedience to Christ. And they sat me at their table, and they told me the truth. And that night I experienced for the first time the fear of the Lord, or what Thomas Chalmers has called the expulsive power of a new affection. The second event was a slow realization that this Bible reading, psalm singing, and prayer was changing the way I thought about things. In the privacy of dark morning prayer, as I turned the pages of my heart over with the pages of the Bible, I marveled about having a holy father who loved me enough to tell me the truth. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, it is, not my, is my word not like fire and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? The word was shattering me, and something deep inside me was responding with relief. I realized that I now believed that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was objectively true, and it would be true whether I believed it or not. The power of the Word of God overflowed into my world, and the image that crashed like waves in a raging sea of me and everyone I loved suffering in hell vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth. We in hell rejected the Bible's interpretive authority over our lives. The meaning of my homosexuality was laid bare. I worshiped myself. I worshiped my feelings over the God who created me. I started pondering the question, where did my homosexuality come from if God didn't create anybody to be gay? Could the fall of Adam be so profound that it exposed my deep feelings as sin? Is my sexual desire for women a reflection of love? Or is my lesbianism an act of violence against the woman I claim to love and against the God who loves me perfectly? Who am I, I wondered. Philosophers sometimes distinguish between the phenomenological and the real and the ontological and the true. And I wondered if being a lesbian while real was perhaps not true. If Jesus could split the world asunder, divide the soul and the spirit, judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, could he make my true identity prevail? Who would God have me to be? The Bible makes clear that fallen flesh and a redeemed mind have a troubled relationship on this side of eternity. For many people in the Bible, their redeemed identity and calling comes only after a long struggle with God, with wilderness, with dreams and hopes and plans dashed and destroyed. What will become of me if Jesus takes over? You see, the cross is ruthless. You know it's an instrument of execution. It makes no ally with the sin it crushes in the death and resurrection of our Lord. 
But what if I commit my life to Christ and my lesbian feelings never disappear? Does that mean that God does not love me or hear me or care? Who is this Jesus? Did I know him? Did I still lack understanding? Could I trust him? And then one ordinary day I came to Jesus. I was in church and we were singing Psalm 119. And when the line, this has become mine, came out of my mouth, I realized that I had just sung condemnation unto myself. And I was actually in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to feel his convicting rebuke. This Bible was not mine. I had scorned it and cursed it and despised it, and I taught thousands of college students to do the same. But I had read the Bible many times through, and I saw for myself that it had a holy author, was a canonized collection of 66 books with a unified biblical revelation, and when the phrase, this has become mine, came out of my mouth in congregational singing, I was attesting to this one simple truth, that the line of communication that God had ordained for his people required wrestling with scripture and wrestling with sin. And I truly wanted to hear God's voice breathed into my life, and I wanted God to hear my pleas. The fog burned away. The whole Bible, each jot and tittle, was my open highway to a holy God. I came to Jesus alone, open-handed and naked. I had no dignity upon which to stand. As an advocate for peace and social justice, I thought I was the one on the side of kindness, integrity, care, and diversity. It was thus a crushing revelation to discover it. It was Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time not just some historical figure named Jesus, but my Jesus, my prophet, my priest, my king, my savior, my redeemer, my friend. No one in my church ever told me to pray the gay away. They didn't have to. I knew by now that Christians are called to take ownership of their sins and repent of them. I learned how to hate my sin without hating myself. I learned that my homosexuality wasn't me. It wasn't who I was, even if it was how I felt. But I learned that homosexuality was an indwelling sin. And I learned that born-again Christians have Christ's resurrection power to actually fight indwelling sin. I learned to die to sin and live in Christ, to ask help from other Christians, and to give the sin of homosexuality no quarter. Christians are called to starve sin and mortify it, to cling to Christ, and to grow in the grace of his knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And I also learned one other thing. You cannot bypass repentance and get to grace. The way to grace is through your repentance. And after we repent and turn away from our indwelling sin, and maybe we have to do that a thousand times a day, I really do get that, we must cultivate what God loves. And when it comes to the creation of men and women, what does God love? He loves biblical marriage. I started to think of my lesbianism as a false identity and my life as a lesbian as a season, albeit a long season, of sinful confusion. I prayed that God would make me a godly woman and if God willed, a godly wife. And I was now repulsed by the sin of my own lesbianism, even as I still experienced the feeling of it. I learned that's what it means to go to war with your sin. The Lord answered my prayers, and a year later, I met and then married Kent Butterfield, 
my husband now. for over 22 years. God has allowed me to be a wife and a mother and a grandmother, a, a pastor's wife and a servant in the church. I count my family and church as God's greatest earthly blessings to me. And I have come to learn that while homosexuality is part of my biography, it is not part of my nature. But the world that we live in, our anti-Christian age, disagrees. It believes once gay, always gay, along with a host of other lies. If I had a dollar for how many times some gay Christian told me that my problem is internalized homophobia, I'd be a really wealthy woman. Indeed, five lies of our anti-Christian age have coiled their way from the world to the church. And I have nothing to stand on. I used to believe all of these lies as once. And what are the five lies? Well, we just covered one of them. Homosexuality is normal. The second lie is that pagan spirituality is kind and inclusive. The third lie is that feminism is good for the church and the world. That should get a little something out of you guys. I'll take it. The fourth lie is that transgenderism is normal. And the fifth lie is that modesty for women is outdated and dangerous. These lies which have entered the church and the Christian college have one thing in common. They discourage repentance of sin and they encourage the pride of victimhood. And these lies have a subtle appearance because Satan is a liar who specializes in the persuasive lie of the half-truth. Let me give you some examples. Have you ever heard that same-sex attraction is a sinless temptation and only a sin if you act on it? Or that people who experience same-sex attraction are actually gay Christians called to lifelong celibacy? Or that people who experience same-sex attraction rarely, if ever, change and therefore should never pursue heterosexual marriage, or that sex and gender are different, and that God doesn't care about whether men live as men and women live as women, because all you need to do is grow in the fruit of the Spirit, as though the fruit of the Holy Spirit can grow from sin. I have heard all of these lies, and just in the last year, from Christian ministries. And this is where I name names, and I'm an English professor, so I call this citing my sources. <laughs> Revoice. Preston Sprinkle's Exiles in Babylon conference sponsored by his heretical Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, and crew. I got three seats, people. And I have believed these lies too, and not only as a Christian, and I have repented publicly as a Christian in my book to you in articles, and these people can do the same. We don't throw people away, but without repentance, we don't trust them. We trust repentant saints, not just people with flashy ministries. Biblical doctrine matters, and it sets the course for your life. Christian compassion for the sinners like the sinner I used to be means walking with them through the gritty battle of hating and fighting sin through the power of Christ and living for righteousness through his Holy Spirit. Christian compassion does not coddle, humanize, or domesticate sin. 
Christian compassion does not believe that man is more merciful than God. Christians do not encourage sinners to come out as gay or trans in order to be quote unquote missional. This is a mission that leads everybody to hell. And if you are a Christian whose indwelling sin is marked by sexual or gender confusion, I really do get it. I've made that case. But be warned, there is a particular way that empathy with people who sin in the same way that you do works against your sanctification and their salvation. The biblical truth is that homosexuality and transgenderism are found in the flesh, forbidden in the law, and overcome in the Savior. Do we measure up? No, he measures up for us. The fact that flesh loves sin doesn't make sin lovable. As a believer, you cannot have a secret love of sin and an authentic love of Christ. I stole that line from my husband. He said it last week in his sermon. <laughs> the Puritan Thomas Watson says, Christ is never loved till sin be loathed. And the fact that you did not choose the sin of your flesh does not make it somebody else's responsibility. Sin doesn't make you a victim. You make yourself a victim by not driving a fresh nail into your choice sin every day or a thousand times a day and fighting your sin until it's dead. God established a natural order in the creation of male and female that is good. And you will be the man or woman that God made you to be here on earth and in heaven and in the new Jerusalem or hell with its eternal fire. God's pattern of male and female finds its earthly purpose in biblical marriage. And a world that denigrates biblical marriage or delays it unnecessarily or grows in its homosexuality and transgenderism is a world cursed, not blessed. And what about the people who will be single, either because of widowhood or providence? Singles are needed and beloved in the family of God. So, what about you, dear Liberty students? Are you crushing sin in Christ or coddling it through some of the trash theology that I mentioned before that masquerades as Christian? May God give you strong faith, faith, selfless courage, and wise discernment as you answer the most important question, and I want you to answer it today. I want you to answer it right now. Choose this day whom you will serve. The lies of our anti-Christian age, the idol of LGBTQ+, or the God who made you male and female, image bearers all, divinely patterned for the purpose of building strong Christian marriages, families, churches, and communities, and calling those outside of Christ to repent of sin and come in where even in suffering, it is safe and good and purposeful. So it's my question to you. Choose this day whom you will serve. Thank you. The writer of Hebrews says that Scripture is sharp, sharper than a double-edged sword. And what I so love about Dr. Butterfield is her precision. And thank you so much, Dr. Butterfield, being there. Can we thank her for joining us?
Two quick reminders. Number one, there's still some tickets left for the concert tonight with Ali Page. That information will be on the screen. I'd encourage you to get that. Also, we have less than 100 spots that are still available um, for next Tuesday and the trip to D.C. That information will be on the screen as well. Um, about 70 spots of 1,000 that are 